Charles Tom Connors was born at the stroke of midnight on February 9, 1936. His mother was Isabel Connors, and his father was unknown. Isabel was only 16 or 17 when she had him, and that's how Tom always referred to her, by her first name. Tom said years later that the Connors' name was from his maternal grandfather, a Boston Sea Captain. I tell his story here basically the same way he spells it out in his excellent two-volume autobiography, Before the Flame and the Connors' Tone. It's a coming-of-age story through which he describes himself from his earliest memories to his retirement. The man we'd come to know as Stomp and Tom Connors was underappreciated. In his writing, the depth and breadth of his thinking is quickly obvious. He was bright, certainly bright enough to carve out an unlikely career in music. And he was a poet like none other. As a boy in the seaside Canadian city of St. John in the province of New Brunswick, the Maritimes, population approximately 50,000 in the late 1930s. He describes in his book how he could remember all the way back to just being nine months of age. He remembered his first steps. He remembered his first escape from the crib. This happening at his grandparents' home with whom he and his then unwed mother lived. When he was three years old, he was impressed by a royal visit to the city as King George and Queen Elizabeth toured Canada. He describes in detail his memory of the pomp in his book, and how only a few weeks later, both his grandparents would die, leaving he and his mother alone to fend for themselves. His would prove to be a difficult story about an often difficult life. Tom mentions, of course, his first musical heroes, Canadian icons like Wilf Carter and Hank Snow, also from the Maritimes. Hank Snow, when not yet famous, would sometimes go to their house to sing and drink. Tom became a three-year-old hitchhiker when he and his mom went to see relatives in distant Tusket Falls, Nova Scotia, near Yarmouth, some 700 kilometers distant. Traveling from St. John, New Brunswick must have taken weeks on those 1939 roads. He describes the hardships of that trip and feeling down and hungry. It was during this trip he noticed his mother only had half a thumb on one hand. The act of thumbing for rides made her deformity stand out to him for the first time. The story was, as a little girl in a poor family, a brick she was playing with was dropped on her hand, lopping half the digit off against the edge of concrete steps. Tom couldn't know then how her missing thumb would factor into his destiny. At last in Yarmouth, Tom and his mom employed a survival technique they'd sadly have to frequently repeat. They dined and dashed this time at a Chinese restaurant. His mom told him to wait outside as she placed another order. As the waitress went into the kitchen, Isabel darted out and scooped up Tom and they hightailed it down the road. Later at their destination, little Tom astonished the adults by showing he could remember many songs, singing and dancing. But after some time in Yarmouth, their luck and their welcome had run out and they returned to St. John, back to hunger, cold, poverty, petty thefts, loneliness, and bullies. Isabel married, and Tom would take his stepfather's name to become Charles Messer. He tells in the stories of this period of his life, being sexually assaulted by a soldier, being abused by his stepfather, being in constant danger during life in St. John in the early 1940s, and how he even almost drowned in filthy Courtney Bay. His mother would have another child, but his first sibling died as an infant from failed surgery to remove a large birthmark. There would be another sibling before long. With mom in jail for stealing a baby carriage, Tom's stepfather had an affair, prompting young Tom to run away from home for the first time. His mother eventually finally left his stepfather, and so to Montreal they hitchhiked, she, the baby, and Tom, who was then only six years old. They bounced around Montreal from room to room, surviving on scant welfare and odd jobs. Tom looked after baby Nancy when mother was out. He describes how he got impetigo on his hand, a bacterial infection which causes blistering and leaving permanent scars. He tried going to school, but he was beaten up so much he stopped. Eventually, they hitchhiked back to St. John, staying at what he called French people's houses. To quote Tom's feeling about his early youth, I moved more times than most people do in a lifetime. 
As a young teen, Tom would finally meet his real father. He somehow managed to pay for a train to Halifax to see his dad, but only briefly, and he bemoaned in his book how it didn't work out. It was very tough times, still dining and dashing, no money, and few prospects for a better life. With the Great Depression fresh in people's minds, and World War II raging overseas, into the slums of Halifax he descended. There he caught diphtheria, another bacterial infection, this time of the throat and respiratory tract. He had drunk water from a rusty can in the garbage, and the resulting disease put him in a nine-day coma. He was not expected to come out of it, but somehow survived. When he woke up to the celebration of his recovery, he was singing the Star Spangled Banner. That was the first thing out of his mouth, the American National Anthem. His mind seemed to be wired for music for sure. After nothing but bad luck in Halifax, the three of them, Mom, Young Tom and the baby, hitchhiked to the Annapolis Valley. There they ended up having to steal groceries and they broke into a cabin for shelter. But they were arrested, and all three together did a month in jail with mice and bedbugs, lice. This one they were not chained in the jail yard. But he points out one big plus from during their incarceration. They were regularly fed. To Digby, Nova Scotia for a bit, then the ferry back across the Bay of Fundy to St. John. He described how, if Isabel knew what was going to happen to Tom there next, she wouldn't have gone an all-police bulletin was out for her. While buying milk for the baby, someone recognized her and called the police. He remembered a big tussle, how mom and baby were shouted in a police car, she screaming and crying. Tom was taken to the children's aid, knowing that maybe this would be the last time he'd see his mom. He writes, that was when the light went out of me. At Silver Falls Orphanage outside of St. John, Tom tried to escape the very first day. Later, outside one day while playing, his mother was hiding in the woods nearby with a sack full of candy and some cake. She had briefly escaped to see him. She knew their fate and said they wouldn't see each other for another six or seven years. And they talked about how they could identify each other in the future, because they would both change. They would recognize each other by Tom's hot dog shaped birthmark on his neck and she by her half thumb. The bag of candy she gave him was spilled in a tussle and ravaged by the other kids. After many difficult months at the orphanage, Tom was now nine. Adopted by another family, he was on his way to Skinner's Pond, Prince Edward Island. For good or bad, Skinner's Pond would become central in his life from then on. In the beginning, his adoptive family's rural home near the northwestern tip of the island had no electricity or plumbing. And strict discipline and beatings and belittlement were in plenty of supply for him just being an orphan. He went from one hell to another even more distant hell, and he sorely missed his mother now across the Northumberland Strait. He'd spend four years on the island until he finally escaped back to St. John. Back in New Brunswick, he was recaptured by the children's aid, but older now and able to fend for himself, he was offered a room if he went to school and would behave until he was 16. So he worked in a bowling alley, shoveled snow, and eventually saved $19 for his first guitar, only 14 years old, all the while searching for a black-haired woman with a thumb on her right hand missing. He had no pictures of her and didn't know anymore what she would look like. Lonely and craving any affection, he went back to Skinner's Pond the next summer and tried to patch things up with his foster mom, an unflinchingly hard woman. His good intentions, though, didn't work. The visit didn't last. But people did enjoy his guitar playing. And the first time he played with a fiddle player, he was told to stomp his foot for the rhythm to be heard. He'd stomp his foot like that from then on. Back to school in St. John in September, Tom finally found the missing thumb he'd been looking for. Briefly united with his mom, awkward, unfamiliar, both from different worlds now, it was not like he imagined. She would leave on a train back to Montreal, two little girls in tow. Afterward, his loneliness was more painful than ever. He was determined, though, to take care of himself. No one else cared for him anyway. He bought a sailor's ID 
and worked on a coal ship until he was arrested in Rimouski. Then he hitchhiked back to St. John. The shipping company he worked for briefly wouldn't rehire him, and he was down on his luck again. Although he only had a short stint on the water, he would hold a lifelong respect for sailors. Older, bolder, and still desperate, Tom hitchhiked to British Columbia on the distant west shore of Canada for the first time, then back east, starting a zigzagging that would last for years. On a summer near Tilsonburg, Ontario, while picking tobacco, Tom would afford his first vehicle, which he promptly destroyed after falling asleep at the wheel, trying to drive back to St. John all in one trip. The next summer, he and his buddies missed the start of the tobacco harvest and were out of work, but Tom didn't want to work anyway. Wanderlust and the music had their grip on him. Tom tells a very funny story from this time. You might want to cover your ears. He and his buddy were sleeping in a car when Tom's innards began to turn. Realizing the immediacy of the peril his bowels were in, he scrambled for a means to purge his liquid flow of excrement. The nearest thing he could spy, though, was just his friend's cowboy boots. So, in a moment of desperation, Tom let loose into one of those boots. Much relieved, he returned to the car to sleep off his ill feeling. And the story goes, his buddy woke in the morning first and stepped into his shit-filled boot, letting out a tirade. Tom was a notorious prankster, so the boot incident might not have been entirely by chance. There are so many side stories in his book. Years of back and forth, in his 20s now, struggling with what he called the cold embers of youth and feeling cursed, Tom would give away his guitar, thinking that foolish dream was what was holding him back from breaking his slump. On Fort Howe Hill in St. John, he had a chat with God, asking him why had he suffered so? Why was he given this talent and this drive just to have no support and no hope? He asked, why is he even alive if life is seemingly meaningless? Days later, wandering the highways again, Tom considered suicide on the side of the road near Riviere de Loup in Quebec, but he resolved it was God that had given him life, therefore only God can take it away. Drifters feel a strong connection to fate. He was beginning to learn to be patient, and that was a good thing, because it would be another two and a half years until his musical breakout. He describes mulling his fate in a chapter in his book called In a Drifter's Opinion, the chapter in which he invites his readers into some insight into who he really was, revealing the philosophy of stomping Tom Connors. He also describes resting for the night in the Collingwood Jail before heading to Quebec, writing in his book, it didn't really matter where, as long as it was somewhere, and only God and fate could decide where that somewhere is. Now 28 years old, he describes how he had thousands of days and nights to ponder life, thousands of roads, thousands of trees under which to sit and continually think. It's in this chapter that Tom's genius is truly highlighted. He can be mistaken on the surface of his seemingly simplistic music and gruff exterior to be a dull man, but Stomping Tom Connors was anything but dull. He was a poet and philosopher, eventually to become a self-made man and a national treasure. His gentle soul is expressed when he wrote, hard knocks have made me more understanding of others. While describing a trip up to Kirkland Lake in Timmins in Northern Ontario, he mentions knowing 2,300 songs by heart no written words or music. 400 pages into his autobiography, after the recitation of so many names and places, one begins to understand how incredible Stomp and Tom's memory was. He probably really did know 2,300 songs. He was no country bumpkin, as he sometimes interpreted. He was a deeply thoughtful man. Tom would eventually drift to Timmins and play a show at the Maple Leaf Hotel. The audience loved it, and bar sales surged landing him a gig that lasted 14 months, this a turning point in his life at last. Local radio CKGB gave him a spot that was ever longer and more frequent. Tom would cut a 45 record and had a box of them shipped to town. They sold out immediately, so he bought more, enjoying rapid sales that were then 25 times more than the Beatles were in Timmins in 1965. 
at the Maple Leaf Hotel, a group of teachers who had returned from a trip to Europe commented how they knew no Canadian songs. But here was a guy singing about Canada. This getting Tom to thinking about the importance of Canadiana, a theme that would form his core philosophy about the Canadian music scene. He would be honored to meet Prime Minister Lester Pearson and presented him with his records, the PM becoming a fan club member and posing for a photo on the front page of the Timmins newspaper, yet another boost for Tom's popularity. But nothing lasts forever. After a long, successful run at the Maple Leaf, Stomp and Tom was let go without notice or reason on Canada Day 1967, Canada's centennial year. This a lesson in the ebbs and flows of the music industry that he would relive more than once. His travels would bring an eventual return to the King George Hotel in Peterborough, where it was suggested he come up with a more catchy stage name. There happened to be two musicians on the bill named Tom Connors that day, so he was introduced as Stompin' Tom Connors. He was embarrassed by the name a little bit at first, but the crowd was enthusiastic, so it stuck. He liked it so much, he registered his business name as Stompin' Tom Connors the following week. Tom finally got his first full-length record cut, an easy session with no mixing, and interestingly, no stopping either. While schmoozing and playing around the Shelburne Fiddle Festival, Tom was invited to open for Canadian legend Hank Snow at the Rock Hill Festival outside of Shelburne. And that is where volume one of his autobiography, Before the Flame, ends. Continuing with the Connors tone, Tom begins by recounting the disappointing experience of opening for Hank Snow, saying how rude he was, giving him an obnoxious huh, acting pompous and arrogant. And to make matters worse, a thunderstorm descended on the concert with the audience taking refuge from the rain under the awning near the stage, the MC told them to go back to their wet seats or just leave for their cars. It was not a great first experience for Tom sharing the bill with a big star. His autobiography goes on to detail Tom's efforts to distribute his records and keep employed as a musician. His travels were impressive. One week in Leamington, the next up to Kirkland Lake, then down to Peterborough, then over to Brampton, and then back up to Sudbury, etc. Long drives in those days. But he'd stay a few days or a few weeks at each location, playing nightly shows, boosting his popularity. Tom got himself a new white pickup truck and had a custom box built for the back of it. He affectionately called it The Boot. To him, that truck was the first place he could call a home of his own but police were constantly pulling over him, harassing him and ransacking the vehicle. But he enjoyed exponential increases in popularity. He was featured on CBC radio programs. He began selling out one-nighters rather than playing low-paying multi-week stints. Through all his popularity as a performer though, his music had little airplay and earned him few royalties, another theme of his books and his life quest. Business-minded though and smart, Tom started his own record company in 1971, aptly called Boot Records. This admit threats of boycotts against him from the industry for being an independent. The CRTC, the Canadian Radio and Television Commission, was then mandating 30% Canadian content, yet Tom got very little support from them. Through this, Tom grew to be a staunch advocate for Canadian musicians. When the Canadian National Exhibition offered him a spot opening for Charlie Pride, but offered Charlie Pride ten times more money, Tom cancelled and spoke out, a protest for which he was blacklisted from the event. As a result, record companies said they would never play his records from his rogue label. This a threat they carried out. Stop and Tom Connors owes winning Juno Awards for his grassroots success and record sales, but he expressed his displeasure with the Junos as they were allowing Canadian expats to win or having winners in categories to which they didn't even belong. He staunchly felt that the Junos were diminishing the potential of honest Canadian musicians. His dispute with what was then the Canadian Academy of Recording Arts and Sciences grew, and Tom returned his six Juno Awards before taking a year off from touring to the protest of his fans. It was through this protest and time off that Tom at last slowed down enough for love to catch up with him. In 1973, he married Lena Welsh from the Magdalen Islands. They would later have two sons, Ta Connors and Tom Jr. With time to fill, Tom wrote the first 130 pages of what would become his autobiography. He then took on some personal projects, such as some carpentry work at the home they bought. He even created a 3,000 year calendar 
and they mourned the death of his father-in-law. The following year, after no improvements with the Junos, Stomp and Tom quit the music business for 10 years despite pleas from his fans. Legal problems with his then president of his record company would cause Boot Records to fold. This eventually prompting a new record company, ACT Records, and a comeback, ACT Act, meaning Assisting Canadian Talent, which is exactly what he would do. He began recording new records at Escarpment Sound Studio, originally near Acton, Ontario, now near Fergus. It's a studio I've worked at. The studio's owner and engineer also tells an interesting story about Tom. Stump and Tom sang with a unique gravel in his voice because he was a heavy smoker, estimated to consume a hundred cigarettes a day and an equally heavy drinker. He always wore his black Stetson hat in public and refused to remove it for any reason, even when meeting Queen Elizabeth II at a dinner in Ottawa in October 2002. Buckingham Palace smoothed the way by likening Mr. Connor's hat to a religious headdress. He did, however, go hatless during his nationally televised wedding to Lena Welsh. His respect for her and the solemnities of the ceremony so great. Deserved accolades finally found Stump and Tom Connors in his later years. He enjoyed some of the spotlight generated by his contribution to Canadian music, using it as a platform to champion his ideals. Among them, he was persuaded to attend the East Coast Music Awards for the unveiling of a prize in his honor, specifically for lesser known musicians. He received the Order of Canada Award in 1996, on national television, CBC's Hockey Night in Canada, he would play his greatest hit, The Hockey Song, for the final game at Maple Leaf Gardens, home of the Toronto Maple Leafs, on February 13, 1999. He became an Officer of the Order of Canada, an Honorary Doctor of Law from the St. Thomas University in Fredericton. He received two East Coast Music Awards, six Junos, which he returned, a Governor General's Award, and key to the city of Peterborough where he got his stage name. And all in all, he recorded 51 albums, selling millions of copies worldwide. Tom wanted to write a third book about his spiritual side, but never got the chance. Canada lost its best friend on March 6, 2013. At his celebration of life, he would be carried by RCMP pallbearers. The Governor General of Canada spoke at his funeral saying, isn't it ironic that a man who was born with nothing, born into nothing, should in the end give us all so much? Stomp and Tom Connors lays at the Erin Union Cemetery in Erin, Ontario. <laughs>